Hi, this is Jeff Kober, and we welcome you as we head back to Disney's Hollywood Studios. We're back here with a very busy update. We'll talk about guests completely going through the Fast Pass line instead of the standby line at Rise of the Resistance, as well as a modified Ray briefing being provided to guests as they pre-board uh, the attraction. There's a new menu at Docking Bay 7, and we're going to look at that closely. Fairfax Fair also has a new menu. We'll check out the entirety of the park and see what is going on. park looks busy, but not the parking lot, and there's a reason why as we walk through the park. While on Sunset, we conjecture on the opening of Fantasmic, and we do a little bit of shopping on Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard before running into Mickey and Minnie. So there's so much to cover. Please join us. Know that we have both a YouTube video as well as a um, podcast. So uh, be sure to check out to uh, both of those and also to subscribe to both. Before going further, let's talk about the parking lot. Again, as I've mentioned earlier, parking is way down. Both Buzz Lightyear and Mickey Mouse parking lots have not even filled, much less the rest. In days past, the parking lot would fill two or three times uh, a week. And so you could see that the attendance is really low just from that variable. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the wait times. You see Millennium Falcon at 85 minutes. Uh, you see Star Tours at 40 minutes, Linky Dog, uh, well, uh, Tower of Terror at 90 minutes, Mickey's Runaway Railway at 60 minutes. These are pretty pretty standard waits for pre-COVID. And so you have to say, okay, you have these long waits just like before. You see all these people in the park walking around. Well, what's happening that gives that impression when the parking lot's not full? Well, just begin here at Dockside Diner. Right here, that facility is not open. And so that is part of what impacts the experience. Moving along uh, through Echo Park and into the adjacent area, one of the major attractions not open right now is Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular. That, that arena holds 3,000 people in every show. You take that and multiply it times five, seven, even in its heyday, eight or 10 shows a day. And you see that, ah, we're missing it. By the way, uh, Indiana Jones is not even acting as a break area, which they had before when masks were required, a place you could go to get shade and just rest. It didn't hold a lot of people. I mean, it, it could hold a lot of people. A lot of people didn't seek out that rest. But again, now that anyone can, um, now that, everyone can uh, wear a mask if they've been vaccinated they no longer provide uh, that break area as they have before we move past vacation fun which uh, is a great thing to do in a hot day and it is a hot day here it's about the noon hour uh, here at Disney's Hollywood Studios um, we're going to head uh, further along and you'll remember there was this great little show called Trials of the Temple, where young Jedi could learn the ways of the Force and fight Kylo Ren and Darth Vader. That was a very popular little attraction, which honestly ran 10, 12 times every day. A lot of people don't realize how many shows they did. Mind you, you're only about 40 kids that they could take up on stage to wield that lightsaber. But um, boy, they add your families who are all watching, parents and so forth. And you see that's what's causing uh, a 40 minute standby wait over here at Star Tours is because those kinds of attractions aren't open for guests. We're moving on past Baseline Tap and uh, kind of looks quiet. Uh, looks like even a table or two is filled, but in truth, you come off to the side and you see there's a pretty good line of people waiting to get in and um, grab their beer, grab their pretzels. So uh, we'll continue here 
and through this corner of the park again other shops back in the background that are not open all those little things add up to absorbing guests and uh, but there's no need to open all those items at least in management's perspective when you don't have that kind of attendance filling out the park well here we are we're at the entrance to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and we're going to cover a lot of things here in this corner of the park as we enter and I love this little entrance it's a little freeway entrance from from uh, the the, uh, the other side um, going in uh, and then you kind of transform through this tunnel into right right into Rise of the Resistance and here's the first thing I want to showcase for you there is no line of people in the exterior queue uh, people are funding immediately inside uh, the queue and in fact one of the things that was very curious to me I was back here at the studios just two days prior and they were funneling everyone through the fast pass queue not the standby queue now today we are going through the standby queue but there were so few people going through, or they were at least moving people so efficiently through the attraction that they were able to, and by the way, this was about 10, 10.30 in the morning when I did this. Uh, now it's about uh, a little past noon. Um, and our group was, I think it was group 24, no, group 17. So it was a very early group and my group today is 52 so both were fairly easy uh, to get into um, but on the other occasion when we arrived I was very surprised that everybody was moving through the uh, fast pass queue in fact it was moving so fast I didn't have a chance to really pull out my phone and capture uh, what was going on um, so I felt like I kind of missed some opportunities uh, to film something. Good news here is that the queue is moving along very quickly. I mean, it takes us less than five minutes to go through the standby queue here. You should note that there are still hand sanitizing uh, machines available if you want to uh, utilize those. Also, the plexiglass barriers have been taken down in many of the attractions but here uh, you can still see them um, being utilized in this attraction currently uh, so it varies depending on uh, which attraction you're experiencing the other thing I want to talk about is that two days ago when I came through I went into the briefing room on the left there are two briefing rooms if you're not aware of it hate to create a spoiler alert there but there are two briefing rooms and I went on the one on the left and immediately something seemed very different to me and I realized BB-8 was missing and then when the transmission came for um, for Ray she came in and usually uh, she turns to BB-8 and says have has everyone been gathered and he goes beep, beep, beep. And she goes, now, shouldn't she be out there doing flight preparation? And he, he scurries off. In this particular instance, uh, none of that happens. And she immediately gets beamed down and immediately goes, welcome uh, to the Corps. We're glad to have you here. And goes into the details of the mission. And there's no BB-8. So apparently, Imagineers, I wasn't quite sure if this was an efficiency measure, which was maybe causing why... The uh, fast pass uh, was going, you know, they were able to send people through the fast pass line. I believe this is a backup plan. Same thing that they have for Kylo Ren when his animatronic goes down at the end. I think this is a backup plan. Now, what you see on the video here is BB 8 is back and present, functioning perfectly, and uh, Ray is having a conversation with BB-8 prior to giving us instructions as to what to do. But I was very impressed that Imagineers had not only come up with a backup plan for Kylo, but had also come up with a backup plan in case BB-8 went down here in this particular um, 
briefing room. Makes me also wonder if there aren't other backup plans throughout the uh, ride and attraction. Soon it's time to board and so we head back outside to get ready to um, go on our ship. And I just want to cover a couple of things that I really like to do when I ride a Rise of the Resistance. It kind of gives me a better sense of the experience. First off, if you have been on a, a time or two before, I can't say enough about how wonderful it is to kind of hang back by, by hanging forward. In other words, being more toward the front of this group going in puts you toward the back of the ship. And I like being back and center of the ship because I like to see everybody's expression when the doors of the attraction uh, open. When the lieutenant uh, steps forward into the ship and gives directions to everyone, they're both surprised by the directness of that performance and at the same time they're mesmerized by what lies behind them when they see all of these 50 plus stormtroopers or whatever lined up and they're heading back out of the same door they came into but now they're on a Star Destroyer. It's such a great and glorious moment. And you want to make sure that when you are doing this, that you captured the moment. So for instance, a lot of people don't know that the reason the ride vehicle is over on the left side is to give guests a chance to get a photo of them on the ride vehicle. They want you to do that then, not when you're getting on or getting off of your vehicle. They want you to do it then. And then you do see a lot of families have learned to actually take photos or take photos of their family. Uh, you know, volunteer to take somebody else's photo and let them take a photo of you and your group. Uh, it's just a great thing. The, the lieutenants might give you a little bit of, of uh, move along, move along, but it's all in good fun and it's just a great, great experience as you, uh, as you enter the Star Destroyer. Now, here's another hint. When you get to this part of the queue, look left and right and look at the portion which doesn't have anybody in it and go down that line now today it's really not anybody on any side of the line they are really moving this attraction in a very efficient manner but it can be uh, bogged up and everybody just seems to follow the other person so know that you can go either left or right it doesn't really matter and in terms of the series of ride vehicles that you can board i just don't notice a big difference whether you are moving to the right side as we are doing here or on the left side. What I have noticed though, and uh, and by the way, there's a lot of banter with the uh, with lieutenants here and I just have a lot of fun with this as, uh, as we're going through the experience. Um, they give me a difficult time for where I'm lining up or whatever and I, I, uh, I just take it all in stride. It's fun, it's fun to give back that banter this is one of the best parts of the attraction is just that dialogue with lieutenants. They're going to line you up either orange and silver or red and blue. I kind of think the red and blue may be the better, but I'm not certain that's the case in every ride vehicle and its ride vehicle path. But I'll explain to you why I think so in just a minute. And by the way, what's going to happen is now that they are lining up everybody, they are going to uh, go ahead and send us off to, uh, well, you can kind of hear the dialogue going on as we speak. They're sending us into the interrogation room and uh, uh, we quickly step in. I, I have to do another podcast where we really go over and we kind of covered the details earlier of what I love about this ride but I'm really to do an in-depth analysis but this is just one of the best parts is you know you're looking at a screen of people sorry to give it away here but you're looking at a screen of Kylo Ren and the stormtroopers and others here but when they come in and out of the scene look at the red light against the ceiling and how that light moves with the character. They have, they have figured out how to, and it gives an illusion that they're really standing there. 
And it's not just a projection of someone. See, the same thing happens as Kylo comes in. He has a heavier shadow there. And then in the, you got, oh, I'm going to get this one way or the other. And there's a whole set of effects there. Again, a little bit of um, a spoiler alert here if you haven't seen the movies. But General Hux, you just wonder, you, you learn in the movies whose side he's really on or... Uh, whose side he's against, maybe, is the more appropriate way of putting it. In this ride, you kind of wonder, who, uh, what side is he on? Um, and is it possible that he got Kylo Ren out of the way so that you could make your way uh, to the escape pod and actually escape? So, very interesting to ponder as you board your ships, which, by the way, is just happening. There's a great intensity with the cast. They're trying to rescue you, they're trying to hustle, but they're also trying to get um, your ride vehicle, you on your ride vehicle and seat it and everything done so that they can dispatch you in a timely basis. This is the moment, perhaps the moment more important than any other that affects the efficiency of the attraction and in fact probably affects the ability for the vehicles to be completely in sync with each other as they run through. It's really important that everybody be seated, everybody has their seatbelts on, everybody's ready for dispatch. Notice they had made the, the instructions take off your caps or any hats because uh, fallen caps and fallen uh, items onto the track, that is going to stop and slow everything very quickly. And so they have to have everything ready. By the way, the screen and John Boyega's little dialogue here really gives you a whole preview of what is supposed to happen. And yet we're kind of, I remember the first several, I mean the first dozen times, I wasn't even paying attention to that because there was so much going on. But, but here we go out and again doing the dance because empty ride vehicles are coming in to pick up others while we in turn are moving to our next destination. Well, uh, eventually to make our escape. But, but this whole little section here is a dance of moving uh, vehicles in play and out of play and getting that timing right is really important. We come up here to the spy droid here and uh, we pull out from there and then we go into the scene with the AT-ATs. I remember seeing these during construction and uh, and by the way, before we even go to the scene of the Adats, we have the stormtroopers firing at us first. And again, great effects with the uh, the lasers being shot across. Then we go into the scene of the Adats, and we divide the two vehicles that have been boarded, go into two different um, areas to be um, where they are then taken. The reason why I like the red and blue is because I like the view. Uh, here you see John Boyega looks a little bit like um, somebody from Alien in the great movie ride. And, uh, but I love the scene where we're at straight on view with the AT-ATs. You see their, their uh, gunner, guns are lowering right at us and then they fire away and uh, we head off. It's just such a great, great, powerful scene. I won't go into the entire attraction, but I will say that... Um, Rise of the Resistance continues to be such a terrific experience. Before we head to lunch, let's go by a Merchant's Row. This is so cool because since reopening during the pandemic, you had to stand a long queue and there are only one or two people allowed in the shop at a time. All of that is gone. The only line right now is to the restrooms that you see here on the left. But once you enter it, the, mar the, the whole uh, marketplace is just full and busy and looking the way it was really designed to look like a busy uh, marketplace and it's just so much easier to navigate and go in between the different stores and and see the different uh, um, merchandise that's available for purchase there so it's a it's a much more enjoyable experience now still see san hand sanitizer machines nearby the one disappointing thing here at merchants row is when you get over to cat saka's kettle that is still closed and the whole outpost popcorn mix which i think should have been sold over where you sell blue milk but hasn't maybe people don't like it i thought it was always great um 
little disappointing uh, to have that experience. Likewise, we are passing right through Ronto Roasters. There was this whole funneling of people and you couldn't go directly through. It's all open now and easy to pass through the way it was designed originally uh, to be. Uh, folks lined up still for a mobile order to get it. See the droids, they've all come back to work uh, since the pandemic. And, uh, and then we head back out into the courtyard. And here, um, while we get ready to wait for our uh, lunch to be prepared, we take a moment to just, uh, yeah, why not drop by Doc on Dars, uh, Den of Iniquities, Antiquities, I'm sorry, <laughs> Den of Antiquities, and just check out what's going on inside, not having to wait in a queue. They're not monitoring the amount of traffic coming in and out. It is busy when you get in there. But boy, there's so many wonderful pieces of merchandise and memorabilia that are on the walls and cool little creatures in their cages and uh, so many things for sale. It's just a wonderful uh, setting to be in. And I just love to just take it all in and experience it while I'm there. It uh, reminds me, I'm looking toward a moment, the not too distant future, of actually going through the experience of getting a lightsaber, lightsaber, a hand-built lightsaber at Savi's workshop. Uh, I just wanted kind of for the whole, I wanted to film it, wanted somebody to be with me. That's a little bit of a challenge to, to uh, get one of my kids or somebody to be with me to film it at the same time. Uh, because I didn't want to film it, didn't want to have people with masks, and that might still be the cast member. So I'm kind of waiting for the right moment. But uh, at any rate, um, looking forward to that moment. Uh, checking out uh, Doc and this fascinating animatronic, which you could just watch now. There was on the app device... The ability to apparently listen to him talk and then have it translate back to you. I have yet to have that work. So that has always been a little on the side of disappointing, but still a great animatronic. So we're heading into Docking Bay 7 because there are a lot of menu changes. The, uh, the plant-based meatballs and hummus, that's still there, and the chicken tip yip is still there, although now they have macaroni and cheese with it. They also have a um, kind of a chipotle spicy version of that tip yip. Um, the pork ribs are also still there, but they've changed out some other things. Uh, there's a new beef and tocado stir fry, which includes uh, uh, yuca and uh, pickled onions and um, they have a brand new salad which uh, has been uh, taken out and also the shrimp has been removed so we're going to check out some things here and no sooner do I get a seat than I realize people are applauding it's one o'clock and people are trying to get into Rise of the Resistance now this video here is about 30 seconds in length but there was easily another 10 or 15 seconds that I heard before. So why I'm mentioning this is this is about the length of time uh, people were getting uh, reservations, which is a pretty lengthy um, amount of time. Usually if you don't get in two or three seconds at seven o'clock, you don't get in. But at any rate, we're here to check out the menu. And I've gotten two new items here. One is a uh, sort of pokey bowl, uh, or pokey, um, pecatuna pokey. It's a raw tuna tossed in a spicy sriracha dressing and served with green papaya salad, pickled mushrooms, fresh herbs, and crispy garlics. The, it seemed to me it was the tuna that was spicy, not the dressing, and that was a little bit disappointing to me. By the way, this replaces a shrimp dish with noodles that they had earlier. And uh, frankly, it was not all that together impressive, especially for the price. That um, Poke Bowl cost me $18. Uh, you might as well go to Yusaki, um, the Yusaki uh, kiosk over at Disney Springs because they serve a great Poke Bowl uh, with a lot better items in it, and it's only about $10 or $12 for that one. 
and um, it was, um, it was, it was what it was. And then also for dessert, what I ended up having is they used to have two different desserts, and then after the uh, after they reopened for, during the pandemic, they only went with the uh, chocolate uh, a chocolate mousse ball kind of thing. Now they have what's called an outpost pop. It's a chocolate pastry filled with guajillo, chocolate mousse, and green milk sauce, finished with the Thai tea panna cotta, spiced pineapple, and confectionery debris. From a um, visual point of view, this looked really messy. From a taste point of view, this was really very delicious. I have come in just to get this dessert. It was really quite tasty and um, it was a good sized portion. You could easily share this with another as you're finishing up um, lunch or dinner over at Docking Bay 7. So it was a good kind of experience. The water is out there now and you can um, grab uh, a cup of water before uh, they never really did establish the water very well over there um, it's just uh, some tubs or canteens of, of water that you that you get some you get a drink from but um, any rate um, that gave us a great opportunity to check out what's going on at uh, docking bay 7 and um, I look forward to trying a couple of more of these dishes and coming back and actually doing the dessert on a future uh, at a future time we're moving into the bright heat of the day but it's a beautiful view of the Millennium Falcon up against the spires of uh, the outpost here you can see a big group of people waiting uh, to go on the attraction long lines uh, we come past the cantina, uh, and I just take note, uh, again, I mentioned the, the Play Disney game that comes with Batu. I wanted to do a podcast on that, but I cannot seem to really, I, I'm, I'm just not, I'm just not having a really impressive experience from it. Notice this line here, um, and these people are all getting beverages, quite interesting because when before the pandemic, this was being discussed as first it was going to be a new lounge restaurant, then it was being discussed as maybe another cantina because the first cantina was so successful. This view that you see right here, these doors, these doors are going to open or guests are going to come through around this building one way or the other to board their ride transport vehicles that takes them back to the Star Wars um, hotel, uh, the Star Cruiser. Uh, you see the... Um, Stormtroopers uh, keeping patrol in the area. We thought we'd come by first order cargo. This is not always open during the week. I think it's increasingly open. Uh, definitely um, on, a, on a day like this, it is open. And um, But it's usually the first thing to close. Lots of different merchandise. One of my favorite pieces here in this uh, retail outlet is the first order um, short range evacuation vehicle and it's really just the ride vehicle that the ride vehicles you experience in rise of the resistance the red is the short order evacuation vehicles and then the ride vehicle you're actually riding on the whole time that goes into the short order that's the uh, fleet transport vehicle uh, with a little droid there at the front and this I think comes with batteries. So it's a $75 price tag pretty expensive and uh, Right now you can't even get them um, Online unless you buy a $140 version which is being sold out there. So it's a it's a pretty expensive hefty price tag um, but uh, we're moving on to Toy Story Land and here Buzz Lightyear's 45 minute wait but it really wasn't that long of a wait. Never really felt like one side of that ride was better than the other. They all just seemed both completely similar. Uh, here at Woody's Lunchbox you see kind of a mess of people trying to get their meals, trying to pick up their order, 
trying to find a table. I do not recommend this restaurant at this time of day. Breakfast, absolutely. End of the day, order early, but get it at the end of the day as it's getting cooler outside because it's just, it's too hot this time of day to really enjoy that restaurant. Although I enjoy several things, uh, the tachos and other uh, things they have there. I'm very good with that. Big long queue that you see going on right now um, for for the coaster, Slinky Dog, and that's going on. At the same time, uh, pretty healthy queue going on at Toy Story Mania, uh, Midway Mania, uh, next door. Um, that's going on. Um, and you can see the coaster, it's coming around, spinning around, and heading through. It is, it really is um, a fun coaster to watch with Slinky Dog in it. Uh, take a look at, I keep pointing toward this gray building. Well, you know, first of all, here's Midway Mania. And you can see the entrance uh, people lined up. And there's a continual line going right around toward the entrance of the land. This gray building in the background, that's the new barbecue. Have not seen one piece of progress. You would think the facade would have at least been created at this point. I would say this restaurant is on a hold right now. I do not see this happening uh, this year, even though there was talk about bringing it in this year, but I don't see it happening. Here's the end of the, the Midway Mania line. Um, boy, very hot day. People are trying to stay cool as they, uh, as they go throughout the park. Because it is so hot outside, one of the great places to be this time of day is Walt Disney Presents. Love the entire exhibit. I just can't help but think, uh, could there be a 50th anniversary version of this that may play out a lot more the building of Walt Disney World and what came to be? I think that would be a great little addition to um, the 50th golden anniversary of the park, especially because, you know, you see uh, models of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and that's already been built. Here's uh, the former entrance to Disney Pixar's Monster Incorporated character meet and greet. That is not happening right now. That's a downside. By the way, check out my previous podcast that talked about monsters and monsters at work. Here is the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. They've got some images showing you what it looks like. The, um, the space vehicle itself, the uh, Halcyon Star Cruiser, and um, kind of gives guests kind of a, a little understanding of how this is being positioned and, and created for everyone to enjoy. There's a picture of the um, lobby area. You see a lot of droids walking around, maybe, and stormtroopers and other intergalactic people interacting with you. Be interested to see how that, again, plays out as the entire attraction, um, well, as the entire resort uh, opens up. Meanwhile, we've got Emma Stone's uh, dress, one of her dresses from Cruella, the new film that recently came out. And that's on display as guests are waiting to go into the Walt Disney story. The, the, um, the Walt Disney Presents has not been doing previews of a lot of movies recently. Uh, they have done one or two since um, since reopening, but not in the last five, six months. And there are a lot of new movies coming out, so it's a little interesting um, to see how they've decided to not uh, preview. We are moving on to Sunset Boulevard, passing by the old Starring Rolls Bakery, which was a poorly designed facility. It's been closed not since the pandemic began, but actually since the Trolley Cafe, Starbucks Cafe, opened up across the street. We're heading over to the Beverly Sunset Boutique. It's been open for about, I would say about a month, month and a half now. And um, you recall that this was completely redone when Toy Story Land opened to provide entirely for Toy Story merchandise. And as we look toward the left, we see Lots of Toy Story merchandise, but as we move toward the right, what do we see? We see, uh, yeah, Mickey and Friends and other forms of Disney character merchandise.
heading back out down Sunset Boulevard, we pass one of the Disney Vacation Club membership information kiosks, people uh, lining up, trying to understand what that's all about and so forth. You recall that uh, a couple of podcasts ago, I did a review of guest expectations at Topolino's, Disney's Riviera Resort and beyond. Want to check that out. It goes into how guests view um, Disney Vacation Club differently than a timeshare. It's a, it's a really good podcast if you haven't had a chance to check it out. What we're going to do is we're heading toward uh, the Tower of Terror, but we're passing by the Sunset Ranch Market. Um, uh, some of these restaurants have been open uh, since the beginning, particularly Rosie's. Eddie's has not. Just this last week, uh, they announced that Fairfax Fair was opening, and that had had kind of a Chipotle menu at a time for a time for about a year or two prior to the pandemic. It's now reopened and become your hot dog place. In addition to an all quarter pound hot dog, there is a pretzel dog, there is a California bacon lettuce tomato avocado dog, and there is a truffle bank bacon macaroni and cheese hot dog. Don't know that I'm going to be trying these out anytime soon. By the way, hot dogs are usually served over at the boat. Um, but, uh, but because the boat's been closed, they've been using this facility instead. And so if you have a hot dog fix, this is the place to go and uh, get that fix taken care of. And then you can always go uh, next door for some ice cream and uh, they're providing it there at the Hollywood Scoops. Nothing um, really special on the menu there. That's the disappointing thing is I usually they have some kind of ice cream Sunday special. And right now it's, it's a pretty standard fare going on uh, right there. Moving on, we see that there is a healthy queue uh, for guests waiting to board uh, the Hollywood Tower Hotel, Twilight um, Zone Tower of Terror. And uh, it's about a 50 minute queue at this point uh, that's weaving in and out, largely through the sun, I may add. Not a great time to be in queue for this attraction, but hey, you got a lot of diehards who love this ride. It is a great ride. It's a great experience. One of the truly great experiences there, along with its next door neighbor, which is Fantasmic. Something we have not heard reannounced or announced is the reopening of Fantastic. When is that going to occur? And uh, what does that look like? I'd like to conjecture that it will be open in time for the 50th anniversary. I also would love to wish upon a star and say, I think they need to take the Pocahontas scene out and they need to put in a Moana scene into that whole area with the canoes, but have, you know, a Wayfinder, a tropical um, canoe as south. It just sounds to me like it would take on a whole different thing. I should mention why I'm mentioning Moana in particular is because they showed images this week of Moana um, in the harmonious fireworks that are going to happen at Epcot. So it almost seemed duplicitous, but still, maybe a little bit of Coco. Note that uh, they also announced that Coco is coming to Mickey's Filler Magic, which is kind of cool, too. Hey, we'll head to the Carthy Circle uh, shop. It's not as fancy and fun as the Carthay Circle restaurant at Disney California Adventure, but it is a very lovely shop. I noticed as I went inside, they used to have a lot of audio that would go on that, that allowed you to listen to the radio replay of the opening night of, I believe it was the opening night of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. May have been Fantasia as well or instead, but none of that, um, None of that seems to be in play. I decided I would come in and look around, get out of the heat, enjoy the air conditioning a little bit, but also, while I'm here, maybe see if there isn't a really good shirt to buy. So, let's take a look at 
what uh, t-shirts look like right now. There's a whole variety going on there and um, different price points. I think one of them that seemed a little bit interesting was the Haunted Mansion one uh, that is being sold currently. It's a his and hers. He's my foolish mortal. She's my foolish mortal. Oh, if you enjoy that, that's a that's a, a, a shirt that might interest you. I am going for the Orange Bird Hello Sunshine shirt. So next time I'm doing a park podcast, I'm going and video. I'm going to uh, wear that shirt. We're back on Hollywood Boulevard in this shop, which has been completely redone at the time of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge reopening. Originally, it was all intended to be Star Wars and designed similar to the casino in Last Jedi or the yacht in Solo. But you'll notice that now half of that store is being taken over by Marvel merchandise and a big array of shirts and backpacks and all sorts of memorabilia related to Marvel is occupying that half of the store. Again, a little disappointing they design these stores for a particular merchandise line and then the merchandise line doesn't do what they want it to do so it becomes a little bit on the side of uh yeah disappointing still it's a beautiful store and a nice uh, remodel that they did uh, on it as i come around the bend at the entrance of the park look who i find mickey and minnie up on the top balcony waving down i think i've seen some of the citizens of hollywood use this top balcony never have i seen mickey and minnie up there which was nice it was good to see them a little concerning that they're standing above the restrooms i don't know if that's the ideal place to have them but any place mickey and minnie these days uh, is better than none i would suppose and the guests seem to be really pleased to to be able to walk in and see mickey and minnie waving to everybody as they are coming in well at this point, uh, I'm not sure if they're waving hello or waving goodbye because we are heading out. We've had a full visit here to Disney's Hollywood Studios. Thanks for joining us and being a part of whether it's the YouTube video or the podcast. We're just really glad that you could join us for this visit to the park. Please make sure you subscribe uh, both to YouTube and to our podcast so that you can get updates as they come out. And uh, make sure you check out our new Wayfinder Society, where we have lots of interactive tools that allow you to explore the parks more fully and to experience them firsthand. Well, as we uh, head on out, we just remind you that no matter where you are and uh, wherever your road leads you, always follow the compass of your heart. Have a great day. We'll see you real soon.